I will present panel three, addressing impunity through hybrid mechanism. The chair of this panel is Mr. Eric White. He is the senior project manager for national tri trials of great crimes at Open Society Foundation. Prior to joining Open Society, he worked for the ICC and the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And before that, he participated in the Coalition for International Justice in Washington, D.C. The panelist of will be, the, the speakers of this panel, sorry, will be Toby Kautman from the Guernica Group, Delphine Giraibe from Public Interest Law Center, and Judge Ivana Hatrichkova from the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Unfortunately, Professor Michael Bolander will not join us today. He had personal issues and he uh, cannot participate today. But we will have the opportunity to listen to Professor David Sheffer. Thank you very much for being here. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, and good morning, everyone. Um, so the, this panel is looking at addressing impunity through hybrid mechanisms. Um, and I remember several years ago, uh, there was a sort of a common wisdom developing when you talked about hybrid mechanisms. People talked about them more in the past tense and, oh, the international community isn't going to support new hybrid mechanisms because of the expense. We now have the ICC. Um, and yet, uh, we've seen an enduring demand for the creation of new hybrid mechanisms. After the experience of CICIG in Guatemala, uh, we've seen a proliferation of CICIG-like mechanisms throughout Latin America, now in uh, El Salvador, Ecuador, Honduras. Um, there's ongoing discussion about a new tribunal to deal with ISIS perpetrators in Iraq. Um, in Liberia, uh, there are persistent demands from civil society for the creation of a war and economic uh, crimes court, um, and, and the list goes on and on. So I think hybrid tribunals uh, certainly are not a project of the past, um, and it's worth looking at lessons from the experiences to date. Um, and there are many experiences to draw on. Um, last year, we put out a, uh, a handbook on how to design an accountability mechanism for grave crimes, looking across the spectrum uh, from purely domestic mechanisms to international tribunals, and, and including the hybrid experiences. Um, and we ended up looking at 33 models in 29 different countries, um, models that had been implemented and some that had only been proposed. Um, but that, that wasn't even comprehensive. The list even is, is larger than that. Um, and then of course, while we were only looking at the questions of design, there are also a lot of questions uh, around how these models are led um, and operated. Um, so we'll be discussing this morning various aspects of these questions um, and looking at the experiences of the spe Special Tribunal for Lebanon, um, the extraordinary African chambers uh, in Senegal, uh, the Habre trial, um, the experience in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the experience in Cambodia with the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. And along the way, I'll make some observations from the experience at the special court for Sierra Leone. I know there are a number of people in this room who also worked at the special court, and so uh, later in the Q&A, um, please do feel free to disagree with anything or add to anything I've said. Um, and I think we want to start the discussion this morning looking at uh, what, what was the driving force behind the establishment of each court um, and, and what, if any, effect did that then have on the court's functioning uh, in practice. Um, and just starting with Sierra Leone, uh, of course, it was the government of Sierra Leone that requested assistance from the United Nations to create a court. Um, at the same time, after that request, um, you know, there, was, there was a lot of civil society engagement in Sierra Leone. 
uh, and after the failed attempt to deal with the situation there through an amnesty, um, there was quite a lot of domestic insistence on accountability this time. Um, and at the same time, there was uh, a demand for a more local form of accountability, uh, a court that was in the country with greater national ownership than had been seen at the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Um, and this sort of converged, I think, with a sense in the international community that the ad hoc tribunals had been very expensive and unwieldy, and there was sort of an openness to looking at new options. And so the effect of that impetus for the court's creation was the, the, this innovation of an in-country court with hybrid domestic international staffing. Um, and uh, turning to Bosnia, Toby, uh, so there, I think the story was, was a little bit different um, where you had a fractured civil society along ethnic lines after the war, a weakened civil society. Could you talk a little bit about the, the impetus for the creation of the war crimes chamber in, uh, in, in Bosnia? Uh, first of all, good morning, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the Bosnian model is one of the more interesting models and I think I, I always, refer to it as the theory of the war crimes chamber um, was very well planned. Um, the practice uh, was more complicated uh, once we introduced uh, humans into the equation. I think it was the people um, that made it more of a challenge than the theory. Um, but certainly civil society was and still is very fractured in Bosnia um, and the victims played uh, little or no role um, in the creation. Um, and I think that's one of the um, one of the greatest failings um, of the Bosnian model, mm -hmm. that there was no real victim participation. Um, the, the drive to create the, 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 the system um, at the state level um, was primarily dictated by the Security Council um, because of the completion strategy. And so the ICTY had um, effectively been, uh, it had a decision imposed on them that they would need to transfer cases back to the region. And, and Bosnia was pr probably the more advanced of the three countries at the time uh, to take on that responsibility. But it was also because cases were being dealt with at the national level um, on varying different levels that there was a requirement to have uh, a centralized court uh, at the state level. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily something that the, the Bosnian government or should I say the Bosnian governments, because there are different levels that necessarily supported or wanted. Um, there was a law passed in, in 2003, uh, which was a requirement by the ICTY in particular, um, because there were, there were certain gaps within the domestic legislation um, that would have enabled uh, the, the state level institution to, to be created. And uh, that was adopted, and I would say ad adopted uh, by the Bosnian government um, with huge pressure from the international community. So, so at the outset, it, it was, and, and there are some of us in the room who, who were involved in that process, um, wasn't an, an uphill struggle from the very, very beginning. Um, but I think what makes it different to, to other uh, mechanisms was the way that Bosnian and international judges were working together and prosecutors uh, were working together, um, not as separate entities, but as part of the same team. Um, so I think that was, that was an important uh, difference to what had been done before. And of course, it, it wasn't international. It was, a, it was a domestic organ based on domestic law, but with international support. Um, but as I, as I said at the outset, and as you remarked, civil society was fractured. There were those that supported it. There were those that opposed it uh, along ethnic nationalist lines, which still exist today. Uh, and there is very little, if any, victim participation in the process. And, and I think that is one of their failings. So, um, of course, Lebanon is another country that um, struggles with sectarian division. Um, could you talk, Ivana, a little bit about the, what, what was the impetus that led actually to the creation of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon? 
Thank you for the question and, and for this panel, because I believe that the, the hybrid tribunals uh, play an important role for international criminal justice, and my hope is that the lessons learned can be used for the future. The Special Tribunal for Lebanon was established as an immediate reaction of the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafik Hariri in 2005. And in fact, on the request of the Lebanese government, the Secretary General of the United Nations established a triple IC, Independent uh, International Investigative Committee, uh, set up by, by the UN to help with the, with the investigation because the concern of the Lebanese government was already that they won't be able to deal with the investigation. And uh, the result of the quite short-term recommendation was to establish tribunal of international character. And then there started negotiation between the UN and the United Nations and, and government of Lebanon about uh, the establishment of the tribunal. The result of this negotiation was agreement, signed agreement between Lebanon and the United Nations to establish tribunal, hybrid tribunal, with all the features seat outside of the Lebanon. However, due to political changes in Lebanon, the process of ratification couldn't even start. And then the part of Lebanese government requested uh, United Nations Security Council uh, to use uh, Chapter 7 and to establish tribunal by resolution. And Security Council did so, uh, saying that there was a threat of international peace and security. So that was behind... Um, behind the establishment of, of the tribunal. So the tribunal was established by the UN Security Council in 2007. However, the text of the agreement, which was not ratified, is, is uh, the statute of, of the tribunal. And uh, I think that it was quite a unique process of establishment, which, uh, which led later to the challenge of legality and the appeals chamber addressed the process of legality in uh, its decision in 2012. And uh, I, I will mention later the unique features which was brought probably with this process of establishment, establishment mm -hmm. as well. Thank you very much. Um, so in, in Bosnia and Lebanon, um, it seems there was limited sort of victim involvement and demand, demanding a tribunal. I think in, in Chad, it was a very different story. And Delphine, I wonder if you could say something about that. Thank you, Eric, and thanks uh, to the Academy for inviting me. It's the first time here, so I'm really impressed by the quality of uh, the debates around the question. Um, the Extraordinary African Chambers is the answer to the fear of seeing Belgium become a super judiciary machine because of its uh, universal jurisdiction but also as a result of a sharp criticism of African leaders against what they call a new form of domination by Westerners over Africa via international criminal justice. So after many political and judicial games, Africa has decided to judge its own leaders in Africa. Therefore, the African Union has asked Senegal to judge Isen Abre without further delays. All the process to establish the um, EAC was victims driven. Uh, as soon as the as Isenabre was overthrown by the current president, the victims have started gathering information and uh, um, put together all means to get access to justice and they were helped into that process by lawyers, by local uh, human rights NGOs, but also by international human rights uh, NGOs. So it was a combined effort from victims themselves first, and then by lawyers and uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, NGOs. It is also important to say that there are many allies within international institutions, within uh, powerful countries, and uh, that makes the process advance. And I am really uh, happy to see in the room uh, Ambassador Raps, who was uh, by that time uh, envoy special for Sudan and have made a lot of effort to help the process get together 
And Dr. Um, Navi Pile, who was here, what has the United uh, Nation, and those people really um, help the process getting uh, to place because when you have committed uh, individuals at the decision makers level, you have a chance to get uh, ideas, um, get into uh, a reality. So I will say that the process is really um, uh, victims driven, but you know that the context in Chad is so difficult and we are talking about facts that took place back in eight, 1982 till 1990s and the current president uh, was also involved in what has happened. The, so every step is really a battle and when we you gain a little victory is really uh, important for victims and many things has happened, uh, many setbacks due to political reasons, but yes, we had the chambers and now we can say that we make it. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. David, um, in Cambodia, of course, there was sort of an extraordinary story of civil society in documenting the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. Um, would you say that was sort of the main impetus for the creation of the court, or was it something else? Uh, I honestly don't recall in the 1990s the, the documentation by civil society to be the driving force. Obviously, it was background, but um, what occurred in the 90s during the Clinton administration was that we had spent the first term of the Clinton administration intensively working on the building of the um, ICTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal, and the Rwanda Tribunal, ICTR. And it became a logical question within uh, particularly Ambassador Albright's office um, that ultimately uh, there, would, there would be accountability in Cambodia, that there would be pressure for it, and that there was logic to returning to Cambodia for that exercise. We had been very involved in the first term with the peacekeeping force in Cambodia, and Ambassador Albright was very committed to that uh, operation as the American ambassador to uh, the United Nations. So Cambodia was very much on our minds, and uh, we turned to accountability, um, because that had been very much on our minds during the first term in other parts of the world. The door opened for us in July of 1997 when the two co-prime ministers, Hun Sen and Ronarid, sent a letter to the Security Council of the Secretary, of Secretary General, um, seeking uh, creation of a similar war crimes tribunal for Cambodia and the Pol Pot regime atrocities. Um, that opened the door and we walked straight through it quite aggressively um, in ambassadorial, uh, at that point, Secretary of State Albright's um, office, which assumed more authority to do so within the State Department. Um, and while we pressed hard for it, um, it took uh, a number of years, of course, to achieve a negotiated uh, statute or law for the court, as well as an agreement between the United Nations and Cambodia. That was the entire second term of the uh, Clinton administration. And I think I have to fairly state that it, it really was uh, the United States government that was the driving force behind this. Now, as the years progressed, the UN became more involved. Obviously, their legal counsel would be a major factor in the negotiations. Um, we sought to achieve the objectives of that July 1997 letter until uh, the summer of 1999. In other words, a Security Council mandated tribunal under Chapter 7 authority on the theory that the situation in Cambodia continued to be a threat to international peace and security. That was our, our argument in the Security Council. It was an argument that did not prevail with key permanent five members, three in number, 
Um, and therefore, in July of, of 1999, the exercise simply failed to create a Chapter 7 tribunal. And while civil society kept pressuring us to do so, the votes simply were not there. LBJ would have told us their votes aren't there, you can't count them, you've got to move on. And so we moved on. And uh, actually the UN Legal Counsel's Office assisted in that project in terms of looking at a more domesticated approach to justice. Um, and that's why the, the ECCC ultimately, when it was fully negotiated in terms of its underlying law and the agreement between the UN and Cambodia in late 2000 and early 2001, um, that's why you see a, a quite different, I mean, not quite different, but a different structure. In other words, the Cambodian tribunal is a domestic Cambodian criminal court. It is not an international criminal tribunal. However, it, is, it has a joint venture relationship with the United Nations through a treaty between an international organization, the UN, approved by the General Assembly, and the government of Cambodia. And that creates a, a carve out for the international community within the Cambodia Tribunal and for the UN, with a UN administrator, UN staff, um, and uh, uh, rules and regulations that are derived from the United Nations with respect to the administration of the court, as well as, of course, a tremendous infusion of international criminal law into the statute and agreement of the court to fill the gaps the Cambodian law uh, might not cover. So at the end of the day, you do have a hybrid tribunal, but it's a, as opposed to the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, it is not an international criminal tribunal, it's a domestic Cambodian court with a tremendous influence by the United Nations in its operation. Um, and so then it, it began to actually, it was activated in 2005 with the selection of judges. It took them a year to draft the rules of the internal rules of the court, which are the rules of procedure and evidence. And then it could, could launch into investigations and, and prosecutions. Thank you. Of course, uh, Across these mechanisms, there's been a range of experiences with the breadth of jurisdiction. Um, in Sierra Leone, uh, the special court had a mandate to try those bearing greatest responsibility for crimes under the statute, uh, the result being uh, 13 indictments and, and four trials. Um, so rather manageable in, in scale. Um, and at the same time, some victims would say disappointing because they would have liked to have seen uh, other perpetrators um, put on trial. Um, Delphine, in Chad, uh, or in Senegal rather, I mean you, you saw uh, Hussein Habre was tried. Um, others were charged uh, but never never arrested, never brought to justice at that, at that court. Um, was the mandate of the Extraordinary African Chambers too narrow and, and were victims satisfied with the scope of, of its work? Uh, I, I have to say that the mandate of the EAC uh, was, was broad enough and uh, uh, the statutes state clearly that it it, is, it has jurisdiction over uh, Isenab, what Isenabri has done and its accomplishes. But during the process, the chamber has had time dealing with the Chadian government because they, there is an agreement between Senegal and Chad to be able to send uh, key accomplishes to Dakar. But by the time the process started in Dakar in 2013, the government of Chad, who was uh, not really uh, happy about the process, have used many um, means to try to set the process back. So they refused to send the main, four main accomplices to Dakar and they started the process to trial them in Chad. 
So we have two processes, one at the national level and the other in Dakar. And um, what is uh, interesting with the process in Dakar is it's the first time that an African country with African judges are uh, prosecuting a former head of state. Uh, you, I, I may say that the African Union have taken this decision after a hard advocacy uh, led by victims, their lawyers, and international organizations. Though, so they have made an open public statement to say that they are key to fight impunity and they have taken the decision. But when you follow the, the process, you can clearly see that it's, there is no real uh, political will, but the judges and the chambers managed to get it um, uh, done. The main problem remains also the implementation of the decision. So till now, uh, it's for sure is Senabres in jail, but the reparation did not take place and victims are dying. So that is also the challenge that um, we are facing uh, now. So the, the EAC has drawn its statue from the, statue, the Rome statute. So the proceedings was uh, well uh, done, well um, uh, organized, so there is nothing. But the, the, the problem also is that the time, all the process was done in a very limited time. So now the chambers has closed their doors. There is no uh, thing left for victims. And uh, we as victims lawyers, we can, we, we have problem now uh, using the Senegal uh, tribunal to, uh, to put our request on what was not well stated in the decision because it needs resources and Chad and Senegal are far away, Addis Ababa is far away, and when you have no resources you cannot reach out to those institutions to keep it going, and that's why the decision is still uh, sleeping, I may say. So it's, it's a good thing that the AEC exists. It's a good thing that uh, uh, we have the decision out, but um, if the decision is not implemented, so the big part of the problem is not uh, resolved yet. Thank you. Thank you. David, looking at Cambodia, I wonder if you could um, talk about the, the scope of jurisdiction at the court. Um, of course, it's been in operation for many years. Are there right. lessons you would draw about the way that yeah. the jurisdiction was conceived? Eric, I just want to clarify. I was thinking back at your first question. Uh, I don't want to understate the importance of the Documentation Center for Cambodia, which for years, as a civil society organization in Phnom Penh, had been compiling evidence of the Pol Pot atrocities, and that was a, a reserve of evidence that was critical to actually being able to activate a diplomatic process, which was what I was focusing on, to actually create the tribunal. If we had not had the evidence of the Documentation Center, I don't think there would have been a credible means to actually activate the diplomatic process. And that's why I want to go back to so much of what uh, the panel yesterday, um, Ambassador Rapp and others were saying um, about the investigative mechanisms that are now activated in so many respects. Those are absolutely critical as initial steps to actually activate the creation of the judicial mechanism uh, to actually bring justice. As far as the jurisdiction of the Cambodia uh, Tribunal, um, on personal jurisdiction, um, we finally uh, arrived at, uh, first of all, it was only gonna be a leadership uh, prosecution of the Khmer Rouge. It was not going to dip below the leadership level of the Khmer Rouge. The tribunal had no capacity to do that financially or otherwise. 
Um, but the term that we ultimately arrived at in the negotiations with senior leaders and of the Khmer Rouge and those most responsible for various atrocities. Um, that term and those most responsible became the, the object of tremendous um, confrontational dialogue between the government and the international community, the United Nations, and the judges. Because where do you draw the line on those most responsible? And are there political considerations being, uh, shall we say, articulated in where that line would be drawn? One has to remember that um, the Pol Pot regime in the late 1970s was all pervasive, so those who survived the atrocities might have had ties to the Khmer Rouge at various times during that period. And that can come back to haunt them or, or make uh, decision making more difficult on these, these matters in later decades. Um, and that was certainly the case. So we had to struggle with uh, that. The senior leaders also, where do you draw the line on who is a senior leader? So I think my lesson for the future would be, uh, one would have to, I mean, if we could do it all over again, of course, I, I would have pressed harder as a negotiator to provide more specificity for that phrase. I'll just say, uh, um, working from the perspective of the US government very closely with the UN Legal Council on this, we initially had a list of, oh, about 25 to 30 individuals who were on our list as probably being viable targets. We ultimately worked that list down to about 13 in the negotiations, 13, 14, 15, I mean, it was a little variable, um, as the likeliest targets for senior leaders and those most responsible. The Cambodian government decided that it wanted an even smaller list and kept activate, articulating that position for years thereafter. And that was a point of tremendous tension. And I actually went on the record as a negotiator, you know, by publishing point, my, my point that as a negotiator, we were not confined to a, a tiny set of five or six individuals. We were considering a much larger, uh, you know, a larger, a larger list. That, of course, uh, uh, was difficult for the victims because they want a much, much larger list uh, uh, to be prosecuted. And so that was a, a difficult exercise with the victims to try to emphasize that. On subject matter jurisdiction, uh, we had the benefit of bringing international criminal law as it had developed through the years, particularly through the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals into the statute um, of the uh, ECCC into the ECCC law and the agreement between the UN and the ECCC. And um, subject matter jurisdiction was not really much, as far as I call, I'm sure I could be corrected, I don't recall that being a, a huge issue of difficulty in, in, the, uh, in the exercise. We were filling gaps that didn't exist in Cambodian law. We did have some issues about um, uh, the extent to which in the 1970s certain international crimes were actually, were they actually international crimes in the, in the 1970s. So that became a point of uh, litigation as well. I would just say on territorial jurisdiction, uh, it was always confined to Cambodia, uh, but um, uh, 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 you know, the, it, it, uh, it, it had no real relevance beyond Cambodia itself. Um, and um, we were able, by the way, on temporal jurisdiction, uh, the Cambodian government had wanted to go all the way back to, uh, you know, the 1970s or 80s, um, and, um, uh, and to stop it, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily in 1979. And um, we had a, a, a bit of a struggle on that because what they wanted to do was to include the American bombing in the early 1970s of Cambodia in the temporal jurisdiction of the court. And that was resisted, um, obviously, not only by the US government, but also by the UN Council. Thank you, David. 
Um, Ivana, could you talk about the, the breadth of jurisdiction at the STL and um, what the impact of that has been? Yeah, the, the Special Department for Lebanon has quite a narrow jurisdiction. And uh, first, uh, the jurisdiction is to try all who are allegedly responsible for the uh, assassination of former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri, which happened 14 February 2005. The second part of jurisdiction are cases connected to Hariri assassination, which happened in, in uh, Lebanon between 1st October 2004 and 12 December 2005. And all this part of political assassination was part of the reason why Lebanese government uh, requested the uh, United Nations to set up international tribunal to involve international community and help Lebanon to end uh, uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist attack, especially with political assassination. And the third part of potential jurisdiction are cases still connected to Hariri assassination, but without any time limit if there is additional agreement between the United Nations and uh, government of, of Lebanon. I think uh, that's, uh, that's uh, despite it's quite clear, there are of course uh, hope and expectations from the victims, uh, victims part of, of Lebanon. Uh, the hope uh, creates uh, expectations. So the victims are, and I, I will mention that, uh, that, that later, that um, uh, impact of uh, trial and tribunal to victims, I think it's quite huge. However, uh, if, uh, if I could think about lessons learned, probably I think it's good to, to define the jurisdiction as clearly as possible in the beginning, when the tribunal is established, uh, because otherwise, of course, it creates expectations. Not all the expectations can be, can be realistic. And uh, the, the tribunal obviously cannot solve all the problems of the assassination in, in the country. So I think if it is clear in, in the beginning, then, uh, then uh, it helps to manage all the expectations. And also one of the things with temporary tribunal is that uh, tribunal has a mandate but uh, when the judicial work is not finished, then this, uh, there is a need to extend the mandate. So in fact, nobody knows for how long the tribunal exists. And I think it's part of uh, all these uh, unrealistic expectations as well. So maybe to have clear, completely clear, if of course it's possible, in the beginning, I think it would help as well. And uh, the STL has jurisdiction over the crime of terrorism, which happened outside of the armed conflict and uh, does not have any other jurisdiction, no war crimes, no crimes against humanity. So it's very, very narrow. It can be uh, later as a lessons learned kind of test if it works or not, but uh, I think the, the impact, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's positive. But lessons learned, uh, my hope is that it will be, will be used positively. Thank you. Um, Toby, so we've been talking about mechanisms with relatively narrow scope of jurisdiction, especially personal jurisdiction. In Bosnia, the, the net has been cast a bit wider. I wonder um, if you could talk about that and sort of some of the lessons that you might draw from that. Uh, I think the, the level of jurisdiction as per the, the legal framework was in, in incredibly broad. Um, but it was the, the application of the jurisdiction that uh, I think posed particular problems um, and for a number of different reasons. I think when the, when the state court was established, it was, it was established for a particular purpose and to fill a particular need. Um, first of all, uh, the transfer of cases from the ICTY, but also the, the failings by the, the lower courts uh, to deal with things effectively. Um, one of the biggest mistakes, I think, was made very early on by the international community when it made a very broad statement that this, this model has been created and all allegations of war crimes will be prosecuted, uh, which created a very unrealistic expectation for victims. So that was, I think, the first big problem. Um, and as prosecutors in, in the office, we then had to meet with the victims groups and actually say to them, I'm sorry, but your case is not going to be dealt with at the state level, and it may not be dealt with at all. And so that, that created a huge challenge for the office. Um, the, the second issue was the relationship between the ICTY uh, and the court. 
Um, and at times it felt like we were the, um, the unliked stepchild of the ICTY. Um, and there, would, there was very clear directions given in the categories of cases that we were to, to prosecute. Um, so first of all, you had what was known as the Rule 11 BIS cases. So these were the confirmed indictment cases that were transferred to Bosnia under a, a special law um, that we had an obligation to, to prosecute. Um, in fairness, the, the, the Bosnian government had refused to accept two cases due to security con concerns primarily. Um, and one case that the ICTY decided not to send, uh, which was the, uh, the, the Milan and Sredoja Lukic case. But there was an obligation to deal with these cases. Um, then there was the second category, the category two cases, which were the partially investigated cases. Um, and then the, the com complicated uh, uh, category of cases, which were known as the rules of the road cases. Uh, and for those that are not aware of it, this was a process that was put in place uh, to prevent the politicization of war crimes investigations that required the ICDY prosecutor to review a file and determine, and put it into a category of A, B, C, D. And the, the A cases were those that were suitable for prosecution. And again, there was, there was a notion that they had to be prosecuted. So at that stage, there was, there was the concept was that the uh, the caseload was being dictated to the office by the ICTY, and it didn't necessarily have the courage to say no. Add into that uh, another uh, complexity, and that is the, the ethnic makeup of the country. And state institutions are required to apply a balanced approach. And so the prosecutor would say, well, if we look at the conflict and we look at the national makeup of the country, I would need, for every 10 cases I do, I would need to prosecute seven Serbs, two Croats, and one Bosniak. And of course, that is a problem in terms of developing a strategy. And the final, uh, I think, difficulty that was, was placed was because of those dictates that were being made, it was very difficult to develop a strategy on case prioritization and which cases should remain at the state level and which cases should be filtered down through to the lower courts. And that was the pressures that the ICTY had at the very outset that most institutions have, is if you don't start prosecuting now, we're gonna withdraw your funding. And so decisions are made that wouldn't ordinarily be made. And so there was this notion of picking low hanging fruit um, which from a, a justice and accountability perspective is, is a very foolish decision to make. And so there was a new uh, international prosecutor came in, um, David Schwenderman, and, and decided that this was a very foolish strategy and, and that we needed to completely rethink how we selected our cases for, for prioritization. And one of the things that, that was undertaken was a complete assessment of the conflict and a complete assessment of the scale of atrocities in different areas. And we looked at the, the theories that were applied by the ad hocs and international tribunals, those most responsible, senior leadership. But what we added into that was those cases that had the greatest impact on the communities. And so, for example, if you looked at, Srebrenica was a, a category in itself, of course, but if you looked at, um, Northwest Bosnia, if you looked at uh, Priyadu, those were the cases that were prioritized in that area. But what we weren't aware of until we did an assessment, and I, and I give this just as one example, uh, we identified a, a, a small village uh, not far from the two camps uh, in and around Priyadu, which was a, uh, a, a Croat, a Catholic dominated village. And all 200 uh, civilians in that village were executed. And of course, that had a huge impact on that community because the, the entire community was wiped out. It wasn't necessarily on the same scale as Priyadu or, or Srebrenica, but for that area, that was hugely important. And so that, was, that then became the focus in applying the, you know, our jurisdictional barriers, but we had to develop a way to select cases. And that's what then um, started a national strategy on, on war crimes, which was then uh, unfortunately, it still, to this day, has not been fully implemented, but again, the theory of it was 
what was going to dictate the policy, policies of the office. Thank you, Toby. Um, I want to turn now to the question of, of distance. There's been a range of different experiences uh, across these courts um, in, in the proximity to the affected populations, to the crimes, uh, the crime bases. Um, and I want to look at the, the challenges arising from each type of experience. Those, those courts that have been physically proximate um, to the location of the crimes and the communities they serve. Um, but I also want to look at the question of distance in terms of the distance from the normal justice system, because there also there have been a range of experiences. Um, so in Sierra Leone, for example, obviously, uh, with the exception of the Taylor trial, um, there was, you know, the court sat in Freetown uh, in the communities, uh, you know, had easy access uh, to the whole country, um, and this physical proximity um, eased, uh, eased the uh, process of conducting the investigations, of conducting outreach, of providing victim support, essentially in doing all of the, uh, fulfilling all of the core functions a, a tribunal is meant to, to accomplish. Um, but it was also distant in terms of its relationship to the normal justice system. The special court for Sierra Leone sat outside of Sierra Leone's um, uh, normal justice system. Um, and although the statute included provision for uh, you know, applying Sierra Leonean law, the first prosecutor made the decision uh, not to use that provision of the statute and to only charge crimes as, as international crimes. Um, and, and this distance, I think, uh, arguably diluted the potential legacy of the special court for Sierra Leone in terms of its, you know, the potential impact it could have had on Sierra Leonean judicial institutions um, and could have had in terms of leaving behind jurisprudence that could be applied uh, today in, in Sierra Leone. Um, David, looking at, at Cambodia, um, do you see there similar advantages to the physical proximity? And in terms of the court's proximity to the normal justice system, uh, would you say maybe it, it was too close? <laughs> well, uh, yes and no. Um, let's go back though. You know, it's interesting, during the negotiations in the late 1990s when we were trying to create a chapter seven tribunal for Cambodia, um, we looked very, very seriously at The Hague as actually being the site of the tribunal. Why? Because we were going to piggyback off of the Yugoslav tribunal in many respects in the creation of the tribunal in order to save costs because it would be a chapter seven security council mandated subsidiary organ tribunal and you've got to consider UN equities in terms of the costs and the talent and everything else involved. And uh, Louise Arbor, the prosecutor at that time of both the ICTY and ICTR, um, invited the, the concept of expanding the tribunal in some respects in order to take on the Cambodian uh, uh, responsibilities. But of course, as she rightfully argued, I have to have the resources, she said, to to make this happen, you know, within the tribunal. The tribunal is going to need the resources. Well, when the Chapter 7 tribunal concept uh, slipped away, then the focus very much shifted to Phnom Penh. Um, and in the end, perhaps for the better, um, the ECCC, um, I mean, for the better in the sense that if you don't have a Chapter 7 tribunal, what is your alternative? And <clears throat> Having it situated in Phnom Penh, while it created certain issues, remember the composition of the court is uh, very much partly Cambodian. So whether it's sitting in Phnom Penh or elsewhere as a Cambodia tribunal, you're gonna have that issue. Either it's all international staff or you're gonna have Cambodian official, you know, judges and co-prosecutors and co-investigating judges, et cetera. Situating it in Phnom Penh did have its advantage, however, for uh, the victims and for Cambodian society. Um, the victims were able to participate in a very uh, extensive way, frankly, uh, quite path-breaking way, 
in the work of the uh, tribunal with participatory rights as civil parties before the ICC was created. Um, that was that was you know. Uh, uh, well, I, should, I shouldn't say it exactly that way because the civil party concept became more prevalent during the drafting of the internal rules of the court in 2005, 2006, and by then victim participation in the ICC had been more generally recognized. When we were negotiating the, the, the constitutional documents of the court in the 1990s, the victims did not have a significant role at all. Uh, that only occurred with the internal rules drafting in 2005, 2006. Nonetheless, now that it, it, it happened, the role of the victims uh, was, was very, very prevalent in the courtroom with their own counsel, their own right to intervene, et cetera. Um, but the amazing thing is that not only were thousands of victims represented in case 0202, it's more than 3,000, um, the participation of Cambodian society in the proceedings of the Cambodia Tribunal was astonishing. Hundreds of thousands of Cambodians attended those proceedings through the years. Uh, to a, an extent, I think, I was just trying to look up the numbers, uh, but uh, when you add it all together, uh, those in the courtroom, I think, reached close to 400,000, and, and those who participated through uh, village settings and electronic feeds, etc., you have more than a, a half million Cambodians who witnessed the trials through the years. That number exceeded the total number of visitors to the courtrooms of the ICTY, ICTR, Special Tribunal for Lebanon, Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, and the ICC. Uh, the Cambodia Tribunal beat them all on participation by society in the proceedings itself by, uh, I, I, every time I visited the court as the special expert, uh, you know, between 2012 and 2018, I'd, I'd go to the courtroom and the entire uh, seating area of 330 seats would be full. They truck them, not truck, they bust them in from various corners of Cambodia. It was a very organized effort to try to get the people from the villages to the courtroom for at least one day in the courtroom. Um, and a lot of times it would be high school students, sometimes it would be Buddhist monks. You'd see them in their colorful outfits in the audience. It was truly astonishing. And it was also astonishing, quite frankly, from a personal perspective, to watch the expressions on their faces as the testimony proceeded and they saw Nguyen Chia and Kusum Pan and Doik uh, in the docket uh, and, and watch them whisper to each other about and point to those, to those men. So that, I think, uh, uh, could justify having the court in Cambodia. Thank you. Toby, in, in Bosnia, of course, the, the court also sat right, right there in the country um, and was also embedded in the, in the domestic justice system. Um, what lessons do you draw from that proximity, dual proximity in, in Bosnia? I think there, there are two issues. I mean, um, you say embedded in the national justice system, but I think it's important to, to recognize for Bosnia that the, the entire national system was changed by the international community before it started. Um, so I think to suggest that it was sort of embedded in the national system is not entirely correct because they had a, a, a rich history of a civil law jurisdiction and overnight we, ch we changed it into an Anglo-Saxon adversarial system which that in itself caused uh, enormous problems and still does. Um, but I think in terms of it being based in the country um, where the, the majority of the crimes were committed was very, very important. Um, I think that the choice of location uh, was not necessarily well thought out. Uh, when you look at the history of the building that was used to uh, allegedly detain and torture um, Serb civilians and Serb prisoners of war, so there was criticisms over the, the location of the building. Um, but I think the, the importance, and, and I think you have to understand it, it was going to be criticized whatever happened, wherever it was placed. Um, but there probably should have been a bit more thought into that. 
But I think the fact that it was based and that there was a sense of openness by the court to uh, civil society and, and um, victim inclusion, I think, was very, very important. Um, and I think that one of the potential failings that we see with, with other institutions is uh, no contribution to institution building, no contribution to building up national institutions, whether it be uh, by the funding of the reconstruction of a physical building or actually working within those institutions, giving them the skills to, to take on responsibility at some stage. You know, we see there was huge investment in the state court and, and it is a state-of-the-art courtroom um, and has been maintained since then. Uh, you, you go to what's now been created in The Hague with the Cost for Specialist Chambers, which is an extraordinary building, but it's not going to have any contribution to the Kosovo criminal justice system. And I think that's, that's an issue that needs to be looked at. One of the aspects that, that, and I think it depends if you ask a judge, prosecutor, defense lawyer, or civil society actor whether it should be in country or not, but I think one of the common themes is, is the question of security and witness protection is always going to be an issue. Could you hold the trials into the assassination of former Prime Minister of Lebanon in Beirut? Arguably not. This, it, would, it would be impossible to maintain that level of security. In Bosnia, an effective system was put in place where there was security and witness protection was given um, a great deal of attention. But having said that, when it came to the senior cases, such as Milan Lukic, it wasn't considered to be a secure enough environment to hold that trial in country. So I think you have to, you, you have to balance uh, these matters, and it's not, it's not always easy. But the fact, uh, as uh, Pro Professor Schaefer has said uh, himself in relation to Cambodia, uh, the numbers speak for themselves. And I think the, the, the Bosnian uh, war crimes chamber saw a huge number of uh, uh, victims and civil society groups actively following the proceedings. But I think more than that, they were able to see the institution, they were able to walk through the halls of the prosecutor's office and the court and see what kind of institution, see how it functioned. And so, so in that sense, it, it was open and transparent. Um, of course, you're always going to be limited. You can't fit 500 people into a courtroom, but you can uh, give that access. And one of the things that we did in the prosecutor's office was to go into the communities and to explain decisions that were made, taken and explain our work. And I think that's, that's something which is, which is very, very important. Um, and so you've got a lot, of, a, a lot of support from civil society groups that, that actually want to see justice done. Um, so I think if you can uh, uh, se secure the environment and if you can ensure a level of witness protection that you're not putting anyone unnecessarily at risk, then it should always be done um, in the place where the crimes were co committed. And I don't think that you can underplay the significance of that um, to, to the people of that country. Thank you, Toby. Um, so Delphine, so in contrast to what we've heard about Sierra Leone, about uh, Cambodia and, and Bosnia, obviously the extraordinary African chambers operate at a great distance uh, from the, where the crimes were committed in Chad um, and indeed was embedded in a local justice system, but the local justice system of a different state entirely. Um, what lessons do you draw from, from the experience of that? Yes, the EAC operated in Dakar, Senegal, which that is very far from Chad, but it was also a victim's and their lawyer's choice because of two main reasons. The first one is security. Um, Isen Abre was a chief of state. Um, there are many uh, ethnic considerations uh, implicated in this problem, and he still has a network of supporters in Chad. So um, it was not possible to have him 
injured without um, creating a security situation that could lead to uh, armed conflict. That is the first one. The second one is that the current president, as I said, was a chef d'état major for Hissène Abré while those uh, crimes uh, occurred. So the fear is that if the, the, the AEC is establishing Chad, uh, we cannot have a fair, clean, and transparent uh, proceedings because th there will be for sure interference from the government to the, um, to the system. Um, after saying that, I think that uh, the fact that the AEC was in Senegal was challenging because we have to fly um, witnesses from Chad to Senegal, and those witnesses are survivors that live in villages far from the capital city. They have never traveled by air, and they have to come in the context that is totally different from their homes. So that was a big uh, challenge. But uh, we overcome this because um, to prepare the prosecution, uh, uh, organization, human rights organizations, lawyers have uh, take the responsibility to go to villages, to, to listen to witnesses, and to do a kind of a work before uh, the AEC was established and also there is uh, investigative judges that come into Chad and uh, have uh, uh, listened to more than 2,000 testimonies. So that was also a, a, a good thing to have the, to overcome the, the distance. Some of the victims have testified via a video conference. Uh, so, um, the fact that the, the, the EAC was not in country was really um, a result of a big advocacy for a justice that could be fair, transparent, and uh, clean, and uh, that the, the decision could be um, accepted by all. And apart from that, Victims have also put a complaint in the, the national justice system against the former officials of the, the DDS, is the Directorate of uh, Documentation and Security, that is the armed branch of, uh, that Yusen Abre uses to do all these crimes. And this uh, trial took place in Chad and was the opportunity for the Chadian population to like, like interact with the process. So we, we have two processes that took place uh, one after another and that were complemented to the result that we were looking for. Thank you. Ivana, could the um, STL have been seated in Lebanon? Would that have been a possibility? <laughs> and what, uh, you know, what lessons do you draw from this, this question of the, yeah. the distance? Thank you. Um, part of the agreement between the Lebanese government and the United Nations in the beginning uh, was agreement that the seat of the tribunal will be outside of Lebanon. And we can imagine the security reason, impartiality, independence, of the court, so, uh, so the tribunal is uh, located outside of the Lebanon. However, we have office in Beirut, not only for investigation, but also for outreach. And I think that's important part. Um, I think we can see benefits that the tribunal is located outside of Lebanon for not only security, but, uh, but uh, when the witnesses who are still, uh, still politically very active in Lebanon testified before court, I, I think it was, it was quite clear benefit. Uh, but I think what is important is to keep uh, in touch with Lebanese society, with the legal society, civil society. And I think we are doing that not only through outreach, but uh, through different programs. 
and uh, legal society. We are in very close relationship with the Bar Association. We provide training for Lebanese lawyers. We are trying to bring young Lebanese to the tribunal, and we have great examples that one legal officer uh, got a quite high position at the UN, uh, and she wouldn't get it without experiences at the tribunal. Another went back to be a judge in Lebanon. So I think it's kind of transfer of experience is, is very good. We have inter-university program as kind of outreach, and we started with one university in Lebanon and STL and uh, Asr Institute in, in, in The Hague teaching international criminal law. At that time was no university in Lebanon teaching international criminal law. But now we have 12 universities working together through the different spectrum and teaching international criminal law. But what is even it was much more important is that uh, through our cooperation, they were able to establish NGO, local NGO in Lebanon, and they will take over this uh, inter-university program because I think it's important that uh, also the society does not really depend on the tribunal because it will not exist forever. So I think that all these activities combine benefits of tribunal being far away, but at the same time close enough to stay in touch with the society. Uh, we have three official languages and we really work in all three languages, so everything, uh, all the messages, uh, proceedings are accessible also in Arabic. And uh, we have a really good turnover for social media uh, following proceedings. So I think it's very important to, uh, to, to involve the local society in tribunal proceedings, especially when the tribunal is not located in, in the country. Eric, I, I found the statistics, so I, I just thought I'd throw them in uh, so that I'm accurate here. On public participation before the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, it's a total of 612,000 Cambodians. Now that breaks down to 243,000 who attended the public hearings, 188,000 who participated in study tours of the courtroom, 101,000 who attended school lectures in the villages and cities, and 71,000 who, uh, 71 who followed the proceedings or forms through video screenings in villages around Cambodia. So that's the, the breakdown. And, and one, one sentence, we also try, of course, to have physical visits, study visits, but we also try to introduce the electronic uh, version of, of court. So we have a lot of video lectures and video presentations and trying to involve them, and I hope it will be part of the legacy for, for Lebanon as well. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have about 25 minutes left. I'd like to open this to the floor for comments and questions. And I see one hand there, one up here. Maybe we'll take a few first and then have the panel respond. I'm David Akerson. I've worked at a number of tribunals, uh, most recently uh, with UNITAD. Uh, I, I want to push back a little bit on um, victim participation. Um, a few years ago, in, uh, when there were peace negotiations regarding South Sudan, there was a proposal for a new kind of tribunal where you would have a criminal trial, but simultaneous, you would have um, truth and reconciliation process, and you would have a simultaneous reparations process, which would allow the trials to be narrowly focused and provide a separate but simultaneous process for victims to go through the process of testifying. Because one of the things we've learned, uh, I think, from the tribunals is that Victims often are testifying to issues that aren't really at issue. So the process of having victims testify in a criminal trial um, doesn't really help us prove whether or not a high-level political figure is guilty or not guilty. And the one thing it does do is add extraordinary amount of cost and delay to the proceedings. And it has often felt to me that um, when you have a trial that goes eight years from beginning to end of appeal and costs $30 million, um, that that isn't serving the victims so well. So I guess my question is, could the panel see uh, a process where the victims had a separate 
but simultaneous process as envisioned by South Sudan that would serve them just as well, but allow the criminal process to be much more efficient and for us to serve the victims better that way. Uh, Bettina, and then just behind you as well. I think we'll take two more and then we'll do a round of responses and then a second round. Bettina Amber from the Vayamo Foundation. I remember a um, few years ago when uh, we went together with the Africa Group for Justice and Accountability, Ambassador Rapp was part of the delegation. We went to visit um, Ka Bangi before the court was established. And um, just to, and we met all the different players who would be involved in the, in the establishment of the uh, special criminal court. And one of the big issues was that the um, prosecutors and police, they all said us, why are you coming? You're putting these millions in this international mechanism. Look the way we work. We are also dealing with murder and we have big crimes too. And we, we just realized this, that there is a potential for, for conflict. You create these courts and the national jurisdiction feel uh, that they are abandoned. And, um, and I would like to ask the panelists here, um, how, how can we make perhaps sure that all the good work uh, these mechanisms and hybrid mechanisms have been doing, that we think a little bit more about strengthening national um, um, judicial systems and think about what, what kind of legacy do you leave for the national systems who will continue for many, many more years. Thank you. So, thank you. I am Juan Botero, I'm a law professor in Colombia. So, I want to follow up on the gentleman in the back's question on victim participation, but from a different angle. Of course, in Colombia you have the Peace Commission, you have the Special Peace Court, you have, you have 25 things, literally 18. Um, and victims, I very much agree with you in that participation of victims, for instance, in the Yugoslav tribunal, I understand 42 were flown to The Hague and only two were interviewed, um, which creates a problem, victims as witness. But there's a different way of seeing victims, which I would like to ask in these experiences, in which, for instance, in the case of Colombia, victims negotiate punishment with the accused in the peace court. And that is not unthink of in terms of national systems, for instance, in Australia, the sentence in circles uh, with the indigenous communities, punishment is negotiated with the victim. Um, of course, this is, this is in the edges of international criminal justice towards transitional justice, but still uh, enlightenment from the wonderful panel. Thank you. It will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we'll do a first pass through the panel um, with responses. Maybe we'll just go down the, the row here. Toby, do you want to start? Uh, I think all, all of the questions are, are incredibly uh, interesting. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that removing victims for the pro from the process um, in the way that you suggested. I think that it does, of course, add cost, and it does, of course, add uh, time to the proceedings, but I think um, that's also a question of how the proceedings are managed um, procedurally and how, the, how they're managed by, by, the, by the court, by the judge. Um, I don't think that you can just say that we should remove them from, that, from the process, but I do see how it does cause uh, complications. But I think you also have to understand that when you're looking at a conflict, post-conflict situation, um, you can't just solely rely on criminal justice to, to deal with that. And I think the sort of simultaneous process that you're talking about, um, having a different transitional justice mechanism running, running at the same time, I think you have to recognize that you're only ever going to, to prosecute a small number of cases, and you're going to have to, to deal with the, the situation through, through other mechanisms. And that sort of leads on to the, to the question from, from Colombia. When you look at the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, you look at the, the, the Truth Commission, which is very much a victim-led process. Um, and I can say that that's something that our group Guernica is, is very much involved with in trying to make that process more effective and more, more uh, nationwide. Um, so I think that that is important to recognize that 
it is not a criminal justice in the strictest sense of the meaning, um, but it is also contributing to 40 plus years of conflict in a way that is potentially sustainable. And I think what's being done in Colombia um, should be looked at in more detail and exported elsewhere. And then the point about the developing the national institution, I think that's one of the, the greatest criticisms of international versus, versus domestic. If you look at the Bosnian War Crimes Chamber, it operated on less than 10% of the annual budget of the ICTY um, and dealt with a larger number of cases than the ICTY did but its cases were not at the same level of leadership as what the ICTY dealt with. And you cannot always uh, see how you're going to, to develop the national institutions. Going back to my first comment, I think the, the theory of the Bosnian model is great. The problem was the people. And in that sense, what I mean is if, if there had been judges and prosecutors with greater experience, and a greater openness to work with their Bosnian counterparts, then they could have made a greater contribution in developing the, 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 the national legal systems. But I think that's something that really does need to be looked at, and it's something that we've raised with the ICC in terms of their complementarity, that developing the national systems should also be part of their mandate. They don't consider that that is part of their mandate. The process in Chad started by a kind of good commission that was back in 1992. And uh, the truth commission recommended to the government of Chad to prosecute uh, Isen Abre and, its, uh, and his accomplices. But they did nothing. And it took, it took like 15 years for victims to struggle and have access to justice. So uh, for, for us, um, it is a step-by-step -step process and um, justice comes first and then we can use the, the decision to start a reconciliation process. So um, I think that it, it, is, it depends on different contexts. The second thing I want to say is that everything is linked. So the, the democracy, the good governance, all could make um, a base to go for justice. And if you, you have no justice, then you start, you cannot start the truth commission and the, just the trial at the same time. We have um, uh, examples in Chad which doesn't work. So first of all, you need to recognize victim's statue by a proper trial to uh, designate perpetrators and hold them accountable, and then you can sit down and give uh, a room for people to, to speak out. Because in Chad, the process had taken so long, and people did not um, trust in it, and it happens. So now, everybody wants to talk, and the, the process will give them the opportunity to talk, and our idea is that the kind of truth commission should be established to have people come out and talk and start the process of reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Victims' participation at the STL is kind of innovative. Uh, we don't uh, have victims as a party civil, as in Le Lebanon itself or uh, closer to Cambodia, uh, but, uh, but uh, victims can bring their stories. They can participate very extensively in the proceedings. I know it's different because we have quite limited number of victims. And uh, 
but they cannot get reparation from, from the court. They can use the judgment for a case that there's, there's a conviction. But what was quite impressive at the opening statement of victims' representative uh, when the trial started is that victims said that they didn't believe that the tribunal would be established due to political circumstances behind the assassination. Uh, when the tribunal was established, they said it already meant a lot to them. And when the even when the tribunal was established, they said they still didn't believe that the trib tribunal will start one day, the trial will start, and then they will be able to come to the courtroom and to share the stories with the judges. And they said that for them it means really a lot for their personal reconciliation. So I think, uh, I, I agree that the trials at international tribunals uh, should be faster, and whatever we can do for that, I think we have to use all the lessons learned. But um, I, I think that the participation of victims, the fact that they can be present in the courtroom, that they can share the stories, is extremely powerful for them, families, but also for the whole society. And we can see the, the impact in Lebanon where for victims, even other crimes, it brings kind of hope that the accountability uh, will come and justice will be done either by this tribunal or that the local uh, courts will also get inspiration for accountability. So I think it is super, super important. Uh, for, uh, for the legacy for national justice, it's, it's a big concern. I think it's extremely important. And uh, so what we do at the STL is that we are trying to be as close as possible with the local legal society, but also with judiciary. It's not always uh, very easy, but, uh, but it works after a year uh, sometime. Uh, for example, and just, just a few examples, um, uh, the STL Appeals Chamber in 2011 defined uh, terrorism according to Lebanese law, but from international perspective, using all the international treaties binding in Lebanon and created this kind of definition. And it was used somehow by Lebanese judiciary. In 2017, the same was with definition, not definition, but interpretation of criminal association according to Lebanese law. Uh, also, victims and witness protection used at the STL is something what, uh, what the local justice in Lebanon is very much interested and we work uh, with them to pass uh, on some experiences. The same is also with Arabic, using for judicial proceedings, because we have Arabic not only as official language, but we use Arabic actively in judicial proceedings, and our translators created a handbook of Arabic legal terms, which was very unique and not used before, and definitely it helps Lebanon to embrace more international justice as well. And uh, one, it's, it's internal tool, it's a, it's a software integrated electronic court management system called Legal Workflow, and it's a software created in-house in STL, and it's a, it, it's a very unique system, even among the international tribunals, but, and we have interest from other tribunals, but also from Lebanon itself, because it, it helps to manage all the filings, but also all the evidence, exhibits, and audiovisual, which, which is, which is uh, I think, contribution to sustainable justice. And I just, I just asked for a statistic, and uh, the team said that it would be 393s saved for all the information we have in this uh, legal workflow if, if it is printed and the team was awarded by American Bar Association in 2015 uh, for, uh, for extreme uh, development for technical advantages. So I think this all, and we work very closely with national, uh, not work closely, but, but update them and try to involve them, invite them also to see how it works and whatever we can pass on them they are doing. So I think it's, it's a mutual cooperation which helps them to feel that they can have some benefit from court as well. Well, there's so much to say about this, but I'll edit myself drastically um, because it was such a huge issue in Cambodia. Um, during the uh, negotiations in the 90s, as I said before, victim participation really was not put on the table uh, to any great degree whatsoever. Um, so it was not contemplated that there would be some kind of almost revolutionary step on victim participation in the work of the court and nor did we plan for that in terms of how we were costing the court, et cetera, and the timeline for the court. 
However, when the judges sat down for a year to write the internal rules in 2005, I think it was, um, victim participation became a fairly uh, dominant feature of those discussions, I think in part because of the French influence in Cambodia uh, and victim participation in the French system is of a, of a larger, through the civil party system, of just a larger issue than in the common law system. And the internal rules were thus drafted very much to accommodate uh, victim participation. That being the case, when the court uh, began, uh, remember there was no truth commission that had ever existed in Cambodia, so there was no exercise through a truth commission to actually let victims err and vent their um, distress over what had happened. Um, so it, it's interesting, in the four cases before the court, I'm just looking at the stats here, um, ultimately these were the numbers of victims who were able to participate as civil parties uh, in these proceedings. For case number one, 94 applications. For case number two, 4,128. For case number three, uh, 645, and of course that's coming up. And case number four, 2008. Uh, so that's ultimately the number of victims who will have a, a presence in the courtroom uh, virtually in terms of through their counsel, et cetera. Um, and they will have a right to uh, uh, intervene through, through the rules in the proceedings of the court. It is, it is not to be underestimated, however, the point that David uh, brought up, which is the cost that this imposes on the system. It's tremendous. You have to pay, uh, you have to find money for the civil party lawyers, um, either through the system or otherwise. Um, and the time involved is not just in the courtroom where they piggyback off the prosecution's case. Um, it's also before you get to the courtroom. And, and for this court, it's with the co-investigating judges. They have to review the applications of the victims and then sign off on those applications uh, through the pretrial chamber, et cetera, ultimately. So that is a very, very time-consuming process that I remember uh, oftentimes delayed things by months, months and months, because those applications had to be reviewed. You had to have staff to do so. We were constantly trying to get staff into the co-investigating judges' chambers in order to review the applications. And that's a very, very lengthy process that added to the timeline of the proceedings. And I would argue when you have very, very senior defendants uh, who, senior in terms of age, who are in their 80s and sometimes 90s, um, you have to be very, very sensitive to how long are you going to prolong these proceedings. You cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that their age does matter. Uh, Nguyen Chia died on August 9th of this year, and so his appeal was terminated uh, from the trial chamber judgment to the appeals that has been terminated now, so we will not have an appeals chamber judgment on the Nguyen Chia conviction. That's unfortunate. Uh, that might have been avoided if we had been able to speed up case two uh, against Nguyen Chia and Kusum Pan years ago. But as I said, there's more than 4,000 applications of civil parties. Um, however, I will also say, you know, again, let me just bring a personal point in. You, you, could, you could sit in that courtroom and watch the Cambodians also see there was always a representative number of victims in the courtroom sitting behind their civil party lawyers in the courtroom. There was always a, a seating area, I think two rows of, maybe just one row, but they're, they're, they were there. And so the audience always saw essentially themselves sitting in the courtroom behind the glass as civil parties and also watching them testify as civil parties in a way that was not exactly like the way witnesses for the prosecution would testify. So that had its impact on the audience and resonated with the audience. And uh, of course, there were so many that watched this. I will finally say that one very unique feature that was developed which I think is a good one to think about for uh, the, the Cambodia Tribunal and, and then for others, is that the judges after the Doric trial of, of case number one, where there was a great distress about no reparations and there just wasn't satisfaction for the victims uh, in any sort of uh, compensatory way. Um, for case number two, 
there was a reparations regime established by the judges, and it was pretty cool. Um, the judges basically said, all right, if civil society can go out there and uh, build reparations projects, i.e. collective reparations, no one's gonna get individual compensatory awards in a place like Cambodia with you know, more than 2,000, uh, vic uh, 2 million victims um, uh, who actually died. Um, the, um, these were collective reparations. And so as long as civil society could create the projects, art, memorials, mental health, you name it, because the whole society remains traumatized, um, and can get it funded, voluntarily and demonstrate that funding to we, the judges, many months before we deliver our judgment, then um, we will sanction those refer reparations in our judgment if we find the defendants guilty. So there was a setup and civil society had to meet it and it did in case number 2-1 and 2-2 and those reparations projects were implemented and are being implemented by order of the court, but civil society had to fund them. Thank you, David. And thanks to everyone on the panel. I'm afraid we're about out of time. Um, I've been asked to try to summarize a, in a, a few final, uh, a few points, um, the, this panel discussion. I would say the first, um, we talked about the importance of victim engagement in the creation of uh, mechanisms of accountability, um, but also the need to have committed decision makers at the international level. Um, we, uh, the panel highlighted the need for clarity in the um, determining the jurisdiction of a court um, to remove ambiguity to help manage uh, victim expectations. Um, we talked about the uh, many advantages of uh, physical proximity and uh, sort of legal proximity of, of a hybrid mechanism um, to the domestic system um, and, and the importance that can have for the legacy of a court um, with important caveats about uh, security and the political viability of, of doing that. Um, and then uh, perhaps finally, uh, and, and as a segue to the next panel, um, just to note that you know, we've discussed a number of mechanisms here this morning, uh, but there are many others that we haven't discussed. And getting to Bettina's observation, I mean, one of those I think we can draw a lot of lessons from is the experience of Guatemala, uh, which uh, has really been a world leader in the domestic prosecution of international crimes. Um, and the role played by uh, CICIG, the International Commission Against uh, Impunity in Guatemala, uh, in that. It wasn't part of its core mandate, um, but it is hard to imagine the domestic prosecutions of grave crimes happening in Guatemala without CICIG's uh, political presence, uh, without its uh, a mentoring of uh, local prosecutors, um, and I think that's a model that can be drawn on elsewhere um, and perhaps more intentionally uh, to support domestic proceedings for international crimes. So I'd like to thank the panel again and thank you all.